So I need to use the microphone because they are filming me. So I hope this is not too loud for any of you. Are you guys okay? Okay, I'll kind of whisper because I have such a loud, booming voice. My name is Lori Getz. I am an internet safety, security, and ethics specialist, and I get to travel around the country talking about my love of technology. I know, that's not what you probably thought I was going to start with, but I really do. I love technology. Do any of you like technology? No, not parenting it, using it for yourself, yes? Okay, parenting it, totally different situation. Why do we like technology? What are some of the things that technology gives to us? Speed, absolutely, what else? Information, convenience. Connection. Connection, communication. Is it fun? Is anyone binge watching anything good right now? Yes. Maybe, yes? Do you know that moms are the number one users of mobile gaming apps? We play more Candy Crush and Pop Words and all of those things than anybody else. I am convinced it's because we're constantly waiting for children, and so when we're sitting there doing nothing, we tend to play games. Um, we also use it for shopping. Anyone? Yes? Okay, yes, absolutely. So I apologize for those of you who heard me last year. I think this had just happened, so I'm going to repeat a story. But last year, my youngest child, her name is Lainey, she's now seven years old. It was about a year and a half ago. She, um, she, I put Amazon Echo Dots throughout my house. And Lainey started talking to this computer as if it was a person. And so she would say things like, Alexa, what time is it? Alexa, what's the weather today? Alexa, do I look pretty? Alexa, I really want some num nums and some Shopkins and some Pixie Pops for my birthday. And Alexa came to life and said, oh, you want all these things? Let me search them for you. I found them on Amazon. Here's how much they cost. Would you like me to send them to your house? And Lainey very politely said, yes, please. So two days later, the box with all this stuff shows up, and I'm thinking her grandparents sent it to her for her birthday, and Lainey comes running down our stairs screaming, no, it's from my best friend Alexa! She thought it was a person. So this starts to make sense, because two days earlier, a giant box of toilet paper had shown up in our house. I thought I ordered it on Amazon and forgot, but it was Lainey in her bathroom screaming, Alexa, I need more toilet paper! And this is how it happens. <laughs> So I always tell the story to the kids, and I ask them the same question, should Lainey be in trouble? And they say, oh yes, and some say, oh no, and no, of course, she should not be in trouble for this. Whose fault is this? It's my fault. Absolutely, it's my fault. Because here I am, and I do this for a living. I talk about how technology works for a living, and I handed my child a piece of technology and forgot to explain how it worked, right? That's on me. So I can only imagine what goes on in other homes because the truth is, is how many of your children know more about technology than you do, right? Even if you're a super tech savvy parent, and even if, if you've got little ones, right, and they haven't really gotten into all this yet, by the time they're about six or seven years old, they know about things that we do not. It's not that necessarily they may be more tech savvy or we're not tech savvy at all. It's that they use different types of technology than we do. It's not us that shows the child musically when they're nine years old and says, here's this fun new app where you can make music videos. I think it's called TikTok now. Um, and so they still love it. We aren't the ones that are showing them Fortnite. They're coming to us saying, oh, I want to play this game or use this app or go to this site. And here we are as parents just trying to keep up. It's kind of like they're driving a bus and we're 10 cars behind sometimes. And what we want to do is we need to get on the bus with them. We are never going to be able to get one step ahead of technology because of this factor. It's like slang. They decide what's trendy, not us. But what we can do is take our very well-honed parenting skills that we have in the real world and translate them to the digital world. And that's really what this is about. It's about how do we, how do we feel empowered to have better conversations about something that we don't necessarily understand the same way our kids do. There's no other... There's nothing else in our lives where our kids kind of drive this bus. We usually get to present them with things after we've had ample time to kind of figure out how it works and what we know about it. But sometimes we end up arguing about technology in a way that they run circles around us, and they end up convincing of, of things that we know are not necessarily true. Has anyone else had this? <laughs> yes, where it's like, wait, is this real? Is this not real? So I, I like to start with an exercise. And I'm going to ask you to talk to the person next to you. So if you don't have anyone next to you, if you want to move, that's fine. Or you can talk to me. Whatever you want to do is fine. But what I want you to do is I want you to talk, tell the person next to you, what are some of the things you value most in your house? Meaning, is respect a big family value? Something that you guys talk about a lot. Or responsibility or intellectual curiosity. What are the things that you value most in your home? Are you ready? Okay, go. 
<laughs> you didn't realize you were going to have homework, did you? <laughs> Alright, 10 more seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, the conversation is starting. 5, 4, 3, <laughs> 2, 1. Alright, is anyone willing to share what are some of your family's values? Anyone willing to share? Yes, please. Doing your best and doing your own thinking. Doing your best and doing your own thinking. Oh, I like that. I have not heard that one. I like that a lot. Being kind, absolutely. Anything else? Being understanding of others' point of view. Yes, that's a really important value that we should talk about a lot. Um, that respecting other people's opinions, even if they don't meet your own, understanding where somebody is coming from, even if you're not coming from the same place. Very good. Uh, responsibility and accountability. Responsibility and accountability. I like that distinction. Anything else? These are great. Why is this so important? Because when we think about how we use technology, they always come back to our family's values. Think about you're sitting at the dinner table, okay? And everybody is sitting around the dinner table and all of a sudden, somebody at the dinner table picks up their device and starts using it while you're in the middle of a conversation. How does that actually make you feel? It's not the device necessarily, it's the person who picked up the device and then ignored the other people around them, that's the problem. It's the behavior that we start to participate in when we say, you know what, these family values, they don't matter in this moment with this device, but yet they seem to matter every other time. And in order for us to stop blurring the line between the physical world and the digital world, we have to make sure that the rules are exactly the same in both places. A long time ago, um, we put a charging station in our house. I think I have a photo of it. I always talk about this. Um, Okay, it's all the way over here. But we put this charging station in our house, and that charging station actually changed the entire dynamic in my house for the better. It allowed us to say, you know what, there's a time and a place for everything. And it may not be at the dinner table the time and place to be talking to your four best friends. It may be time to be talking to your parents. And so it allowed us to put it someplace so that it wasn't in our hands. One of the things that we find most often is that if you have a device actually in your hand, you are seven times more likely to look at the device as if the device was put away someplace else. It's our go-to. We don't even realize we do it. It's become kind of this automatic response. It's not even necessarily a conscious response. It's a subconscious response. That if it dings or vibrates, or even if we think it's vibrating, some of us are suffering from something called phantom vibration syndrome, where we think our device is vibrating even when it's not. That's your brain stimming for information. It's like looking for that input. But when we have it in our hands, it tends to be our go-to. And we can be in the middle of a wonderful conversation with somebody face-to-face, -face, but because it's there, it tends to draw us in. And we tend to put this in front of this in that moment. And so we put that charging station there to remind us of our family values, where there's, and for us, it's that there's a time and a place for everything. And being connected to the person right in front of you is more important than being connected to somebody else who's not with us in that moment. Does that make sense? So it helps us kind of take it back to, to why we do the things that we do. One of the other things that I find a lot is that we tend to make rules that we don't even believe in. Because we don't know if our rules are correct or if they're not correct. Has anyone ever had this happen where you make up a rule that's somewhat arbitrary because you think you need to make a rule for it? Sometimes it's things like, okay, you can have 30 minutes of screen time during the week and then you can have two hours each day on the weekend. Where did those numbers come from? <laughs> Why? Right? Why 30 minutes during the week and two hours on the weekend? Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics kind of started this actually because about 12 years ago they came out and said that children between the ages of 6 and 17 should not have more than two hours of screen time per day. Then they came back three weeks later and said, oh, that doesn't include schoolwork. And so I said, hang on a second, American Academy of Pediatrics, where did this even come from? Why is this rule even here? And what I found out is that that was an obesity study, not a technology study. 
which was saying that the more kids sit, the bigger they get. Okay, so then can I not allow my children to read for two hours at a time? Well, actually, no, I can't. <laughs> I now understand this. Because in order for they, them to be healthy in their bodies, they need to get up and move. We don't realize the ergonomic effect that it has on all of us, the way we use the devices and the way that we sit too much, but it's something that we need to look at. Do you know that when you hold your device in this position, that's approximately 60 pounds of pressure on your spine because gravity is pulling down. We now have a whole new group of chiropractors that are focusing on pediatrics that did not exist five years ago because we're seeing more kids with curves in their spines and rolled shoulder syndrome and what I call claw hand. They're ending up with tendonitis, de Quare veins, carpal tunnel syndrome, at earlier and earlier ages. We're seeing kids get more, and we're seeing more and more glasses being put on children. Uh, we have a whole group of ophthalmologists that are now talking about something. It's, I think it's myopia, it's an eye disease that is based on eye strain because we've got these tiny little screens that are right in front of our faces that are actually causing problems, that are causing health problems for us that we didn't necessarily realize. We went back to using our television. We kind of stopped using our TV for a while, and I didn't even realize it happened. It happens so slowly, doesn't it? These things we start, we do it one time, and then it creeps into the next time, and the next time, and the next time, and all of a sudden we form this new habit. But we've gone back to our television for a couple of reasons. One, because the screen is far enough away. I don't know if you ever had this, but my mom used to yell at me when I was a kid to move back from the TV, and I used to ask her why, and she would say, I don't know, just do it anyway. Well, we now know why, because the closer you are, the more eye strain. And because the light, the spectrum of light that comes through it, the blue light, it's really, really hard on our eyes. And when we're that close to it, it's even more eye strain. So we started throwing things up to the television. We now watch, and sometimes we even watch YouTube videos on the TV rather than watching them on a device. There's another reason for that too, because YouTube is not censored and all sorts of stuff comes through, even when you try and put on parental controls or use kid-friendly uh, versions of YouTube. But we'll get into that in a little bit. So we started to make certain changes based on information that we know is real, not these arbitrary rules. But how do we decide what they can and cannot do as far as, are any of your kids playing games like Fortnite or do they have social media accounts? How many of your kids have some form of social media, whether it's Instagram or Snapchat or, okay, just a couple. Um, how many of your kids are gaming online? Fortnite or any of the Xbox games, any of the sports games, a few of those. Okay, anybody, any of your kids watching YouTube videos? That's, that's a really good one right now. Okay, anything, they're streaming music, they're watching Netflix, Hulu, anything else? What are some of the other things that they're really into right now? Did I, did I get most of them? Okay, terrific. So in order for us to kind of understand what they can and cannot do, we need more information about how all this stuff works. One of the things that I tell the kids is that the internet is a vortex that sucks information. And absolutely every single thing we say and do online gets dropped into this vortex. Everything. If you send an email through Gmail, you give Google the right to read, store, and sell information about the things you were talking about in that email. When you enable a microphone on Instagram so that you can make videos so the kids can put things on the Insta story, that's what it's called, the place where they can kind of make that slideshow in Instagram. When you enable that microphone, you actually give Instagram the right to listen to you while the app is running in the background and they can record things you're talking about, pull out keywords and sell that information to third party advertisers. When you try and, when kids try and private browse online, which they always do, right? They think they, they can go incognito or private browse so no one sees what they're doing. And I'm gonna show them this today, I'll show you too. Um, but they're not actually as hidden as they think. In fact, it even tells them when they go incognito that your activity might still be visible to the websites you visit, your school, your employer, and your internet service provider. It tells you right there that every single website you visit is being dropped into this internet vortex. Why? Because if we're not paying for systems, they are using our information as the monetary value so that they can match third-party advertisers to us. And it makes our browsing experience better. It really does. It's not some nefarious person sitting there at Google reading all of your emails. It's these giant supercomputers that scan everything we do and say, and then they pull out keywords in order to match us to somebody or something we might like. I was talking about going to the grocery store, I needed more bread, and the next day I ended up with ads for Panera Bread. 
I, my nephew Matthew, a few years back, was playing on Minecraft on a uh, console, on a video game console, and he kept calling another player a butthead because this person kept trolling his city. The next day, my sister-in-law was getting ads on her computer for <laughs> to make your booty bigger, right? <laughs> and so it went from the gaming console in the house to the computer in the house. What we don't always realize is that everything we do, not only is the vortex collecting it, but it all kind of gets attached together. When you create something, create an account, or you do something on a device like this, and then it goes and it sits on your home network, everything you just did on this device gets attached to your home address. And it gets attached to all the other devices in the house. So if you're wondering what your kids are looking at online, all you need to do is pay attention to the ads that you're getting, and it will give you a pretty good indication of what's going on. Have you noticed this? Have you noticed this, that these ads are things that you were actually talking about, right? And so one of the things that we need to make sure the kids understand is this issue related to privacy, because they always think that everything they say and do online is actually private. But what does that word mean? What does the word privacy actually mean? Okay, I'm gonna have to talk to the person next to you again. And you're gonna define the word privacy for me. Now, a couple of things. Please don't tell me it's the opposite of public, because that's an antonym and not a definition. Please don't tell me it doesn't exist on the internet, and please don't use your device to look it up. All right? <laughs> Let's speculate. Let's give it a try and see what happens. All right. On the count of three, you have 45 seconds. What does privacy mean? Go. <laughs> Unless you're clear, you're probably still there. Are you putting your hands on the Okay, here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. What does the word privacy mean? You're going to tell me what your partner said. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not giving up their privacy. What do you think? Your right to not share. Yes, your right to not share certain things. Very good. Anybody else? Did anyone, did anyone talk about the bathroom? Usually. Oh, you did? Yay! The adults don't usually talk about the bathroom. The kids always do. But that's my favorite example of privacy. Because when you go into a bathroom and you close and you lock a door, you're doing this because you're trying to control your environment. You don't want anyone to see you doing your business while you're doing your business. And so that's what the word means. It's your right to control who sees what, who knows what, how much they see, and how much they know. But if we're talking about the internet as a vortex, then we've got to talk about who actually controls this information once we put it out there. There's two groups that control the information. The first group are the companies, right? This is Google and Amazon and Facebook and Snapchat, all these people. They get to control it. They're not doing anything bad with our information. Does it affect our personal safety? No. Does it affect our right to privacy? Yes, it does. But I can make decisions about what I will and will not purchase online based on understanding this fact alone that I have no problem buying my groceries through Amazon, but I absolutely will not buy medication through a third-party pharmacy somewhere in Canada because I don't want my medical information being dropped into this vortex. But if, I, if we don't understand what's actually happening to it, we can't make decisions. Who's the other group that has to control everything we put out there? No. Only the government. The government conspiracies are my favorite. Only if you're doing something illegal. Otherwise, the government's not paying too much attention. But that's a good one. Um, it's the people with whom we share. And this is the one the kids always forget. They think if they send something via Snapchat. Do you, are you guys familiar with Snapchat? This is an app that lets you take pictures and send them, and they self-destruct after three seconds or 10 seconds. You can also use uh, your Snapchat story. And on your story, you can leave things up for 24 hours. And so what the kids think is, oh, well, after it's out there, it's going to disappear. Or it's a private account, so no one can really see it. But they just transferred control of that content to all the people who are already following them. And they forget about that fact. Are there certain things that our kids should never give up control of? Yes. Like what? Personal information. Okay, personal information. 
unless they need to like order a Domino's pizza and then they're gonna tell a total stranger their name, address, and phone number. But yes, in Instagram, they should not be saying, hey, I lost my phone, can you put your, can you put your email and your address and your phone number here? Absolutely, like right time and place. Very good, what else? What do we not give up control of? Uh-huh. Well, anything sexual, like pictures of being undressed or stuff like that. Right, our bodies, okay. very good, absolutely. And we start having that conversation when they're like two years old, right? How many of you have had a conversation with your child at some point about their private parts? And what we're really talking about is their control of their bodies. That nobody else should be touching these parts because it's within their control. But as they get older, we stop talking about their bodies. We stop talking about the control of their bodies. Usually it's because it's very highly embarrassing for them to have the conversation, so we tend to back away from them. But we shouldn't. We should continue to talk about control of the body because it's such an important concept for them to understand. I had a situation about, about two years ago now where I had six sixth grade boys think that it was really funny, they were at a sleepover, to take their cell phones, stick them down their pants, take pictures of their parts. Um, they then put them on a Finsta. Finsta is a fake Instagram account. It's the second Instagram account. A lot of kids will get an Instagram account that you know about, and then they'll get a second one that you don't know about. So that's their Finsta. Um, if you wanna know if they have one, just look on Instagram when they have it open. There'll be a little carrot, and if it's a drop down, you know there's a second account attached to that phone. So there you go, little insight to that. Um, but when they put it on the Finsta, the reason they did that, they put all six pictures on, and then they encouraged their classmates to come to the account to play a game where they could match the boy to the parts. They thought this was hysterical. So within about, so one of the little girls who received this Instagram, you know, please follow me, uh, she didn't know what she was looking at and it scared her. And so she showed it to her mom. And then mom is like, who is sending you pictures of their junk? And so mom called the police. And I totally get that. I would have done the exact same thing. And so it took the police about an hour to get a search warrant, to put together a forensic team, to go to the house where the six boys were and to find out what was going on. Now, one of my favorite parts about this story is that the boys thought that they had done this so well that nobody would ever know who they were because they did something where they tried to mask their IP addresses. They Googled how to stop the internet vortex from knowing my location. And so they tried to make it so that their IP address was hidden. That's the address that is attached to all your devices. All of your device has a unique address the same way your home does. Um, and so they did that. They also put up a white sheet behind them so that you could not see the house and where they were. They turned off something called geotagging, which again puts the location inside the picture. It's a small piece of code in the picture. And they didn't put their faces on it. So they thought that they were safe. They truly believed this. So then when the police showed up with the forensic team and they said, all right, did you guys do this? The boys were like, no, 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 it wasn't us. So that the forensic team said, well, I guess then you guys are gonna have to drop your pants because that's how we're gonna have to identify you. And then the boy said, okay, it was us. <laughs> they did not realize that they had just committed a crime. They produced, possessed, and distributed child pornography. 11-year-olds. Produced, possessed, and distributed child pornography. Now, luckily, the prosecutor in this area is a very reasonable human being, which I am so grateful for, um, and decided that these six boys should not end up on a registered sex offenders list for the rest of their lives because that is one of the potential consequences of doing this. And the reason why a prosecutor might actually do that is because they exposed other minors to this child pornography completely unsolicited. This was not like a consensual thing where one teenager says, hey, you know, I want to send you a new pic. You say, it's not like the, I show you yours, you show me mine kind of situation. This was them putting it on these other kids. <sighs> Children do not have the natural ability to use reason, logic, and impulse control in these moments. And it's because their brains are not ready to use reason, logic, and impulse control in these moments. The uh, child's brain goes through puberty before their body does. And so it usually starts somewhere around nine or 10 years old, where their brains start to go wonky. And you might have seen this, if you've got kids in this age range, where one day you had this amazing kid who could follow a string of directions without a problem at all. And they were really stable in their moods and kind of just fun and happy and not super stressed. 
And then one day they woke up and couldn't figure out how to get from their bedroom to the bathroom. <laughs> Has anyone had this happen? <laughs> it's amazing, but it's what's going on inside their brains is the part of the brain that is exploding and developing is called the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain. And so every decision they make in these moments is driven by emotion, by how they feel, by what they want and what their peers will think of them. Reason, logic, and impulse control, it takes a whole lot of extra effort to put that on top of these feelings. There are definitely kids who can do it more easily than other kids can. Now, this is not an excuse. You, the kids can't say, sorry, mom and dad, I did this because my frontal lobe was underdeveloped. Like, that's not going to work. They might try it, but it's not gonna work. But there is truly a neurological reason why they are behaving like such kooky people right now and why they do these things. Um, it's part of evolution that by the time they get to 11 and 12 years old, that they do not want to bond with you as much anymore and only care about what their peers think. It's called peer pleasure, not peer pressure. That comes later. But peer pleasure is this idea that a child will do anything to make their friends happy. And the reason that this is part of evolution is because Back in the old days when we would get married at like 12, 13, 14 years old because the whole thing was just about reproducing, there is a bonding chemical in the brain that bonds you to another person of your own age and not necessarily to your parents. So if you all of a sudden have a child who used to talk to you and give you all kinds of information and now all they want to do when they get in the car is this, it's because they're bonding with somebody other than you. <laughs> It hurts our feelings, doesn't it? It does. I actually said to my kids at some point in time, it hurts my feelings that you don't even want to give me 10 minutes of your time. And when I say that, I often get a child who will put down a device and be like, okay, I'm here. Right? Because I'm not screaming and yelling, even though I have done this in the past. I'm so sick of that device, I'm going to throw it out the window. It's not the device. I miss the child. <laughs> I miss the moment where I did not have to compete with their friends for their attention. But this is part of growing up, and as difficult as it is, when we start to recognize this as parents, that they're not just behaving like little jerks, that there's actually something neurological going on, it allows us to kind of get over some of the eye rolling. Listen, if your child rolls their eyes at you, this is a good thing. This means they heard you. <laughs> and so when your child rolls their eyes the next time and they're expecting you to get really upset, if you just say, aw, that's great, that means you heard me, they're not going to know what to do with that. And we win. No, it's not about winning. Okay, maybe it's about winning, just a little bit. Uh, so, but understanding some of these things is really important. And understanding this idea that when we talk to them about privacy, that we change the conversation to be about control. Who gets to control these things? When your kids get to the point where they're using all this stuff and they say, oh, but it's a private account, what does that mean? Are you okay with the content you are sharing because you now transferred control to all these people? Usually in about fourth grade, do you have any fourth grade parents in here? Okay, fourth grade parents. So texting, group texting, has it started? Not yet? Okay, it's coming. So the group texting usually starts second semester of fourth grade. I don't know why, it's just when it happens. I think maybe like at Christmas time, a lot of kids start to get devices that they're allowed to use. The average age that a child gets a smartphone is 10. I'm not saying you should get your child a smartphone at 10, I'm just saying that's what the average is at the moment. But second semester, fourth grade, something happens with the group texting. That all of a sudden they're realizing that they can communicate with each other where there's no adults paying attention. And so they start experimenting with all kinds of fun language. <laughs> And sometimes the language is not necessarily appropriate and doesn't work for you. And so what you want to make sure they understand is when you put that out there, you give up control of what happens to that information. If you're going to say something like this, and again, it's, I don't know what it is with, I'm not a boy, so I do not understand their desire at that age to talk about their body parts all the time. <laughs> uh, but a lot of times they're using some of these words, and I had a group of kids that were playing, do you guys, Forgive me, I'm just going to be honest. There's a game, the penis game, where somebody starts by saying the word very softly and then it gets louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. So there's this new kind of 
trend that's happening right now where they're playing this game online, basically, where somebody will text it all in like small letters and then they'll put it in all caps and then they'll put it twice and then they'll put it four times. And so you end up with these group texts where it's just the word penis for like pages and pages and pages. Um, but again, they all think this is funny, but it makes some kids uncomfortable. And a lot of times what ends up happening is somebody takes it to a parent and they're like, here's what's going on. The parent takes a screenshot and then all of a sudden it ends up at school. They don't think through that part. And that's why it's so important that as they start doing all these things that we're paying attention. They have no true semblance of privacy in elementary school. So if you're sitting with them as they're texting and you're kind of watching what they're doing, they're not gonna have too much of an issue with this. By the time they get into middle school, it changes. They want more privacy. Does that mean that we stop asking them questions about who they're texting with and the kinds of stuff they're talking about? No, we absolutely should be asking a lot of those questions. And the truth is, is that they shouldn't have these devices in private spaces. If there's no expectation of privacy in this internet vortex, then the devices do not belong in private spaces. They don't belong in the bedroom and they don't belong in the bathroom. Because when you've got a child that is texting and they're sitting three feet away from you, there is a much better chance that they are not going to do something that's going to get them into a whole world of trouble because they know at any point in time you might peer over. When they go into a bedroom and they have total privacy with this thing that isn't actually private, that's when things happen and mistakes get made and they have long-term consequences because of this lack of control. Do you have any questions about this? Please. Not exactly a question about a years ago. So my son is almost 13, and years ago they made a phone for Sprint did like a really simple phone, basically where you could just call or you could text to you. And do they have a gizmo? So yeah, so there's something called a gizmo, um, and there's different versions of this, but the gizmo is a watch, and my seven-year-old has one. And the reason that she has one is she's a gymnast and she also walks home from school from time to time. And so I wanted her to be able to call me. It was important. The office closes and so she can't always call me from the office at gymnastics. So the gizmo, it only calls four numbers and only four numbers can call her. It does not text though and there's no gaming on it. I think, I think yeah. it's 10 now. I think you can write messages on it. My son has one. It, she has the one that does not. So my seven-year-old, I did not want her to, I didn't want her texting, I didn't want her, uh, it's something. Um, and hers doesn't even have a keypad on it. It's just a single button. It's like little pictures, emojis that can send to you. Yes, and so hers, hers doesn't. So, but I purposely did that because I wanted to keep it as simple as possible just because I needed her to have what she needed. So, yeah, you can talk on it. And so that, that works for some kids, you know, which I'm just gonna talk about this. Is anybody wondering like at what age should I get my child a device? Yes, yes? okay, let me just cover this here. Um, so there is no magic age for when they should get a device, but what should happen is it should be a life event. It should be tied directly to a life event. That life event can be a lot of different things. I know five-year-olds who have iPhones for very good reasons. Um, if they are in two households and the parents may not be communicating well and one parent wants to be able to FaceTime with the child when they're at the other parent's house, I get that. Um, and then my seven-year-old has the gizmo because that's what I needed her to have. At 10, my daughter Charlie, I gave her a uh, flip phone, which was a disaster. I do not recommend doing this. Um, and the reason I say that is because I needed her to be able to text me. Um, I needed, she was walking her five-year-old sister home from school at this point, and I wanted her to be able to send me a text saying, hey, we're walking home from school. So I give her this flip phone, and I put like $20 of prepaid minutes on it, and I realized that, do you guys remember what it was like to text on a flip phone? How you've got to like, okay, so here she is trying to walk home from school and text me at the same time. Now she's walking and texting, and she fell into a pole, which is very Charlie-like because she is not... Anyways, she's not the most coordinated child. Um, she's wonderful, but she being able to do it like that wasn't working for us. And so I went ahead and I got out one of my old iPhones that I had. I think it was an iPhone 4, and I turned it into kind of like a dumb phone. She could call and she could text on it because that was all I needed her to be able to do at that point in time. As she's gotten older, I've been able to open up a whole lot more for her, and I find that it's actually enhanced our relationship. Her having this phone has made my life easier, her life easier. She communicates more with her, with her uh, cousins and her aunts and her uncles in a really, really positive way. But she also comes home every day and takes that device and puts it on the charging station every single day. 
That is the first thing she does, that we've developed this habit in the house where I do it, my husband does it, the children do it. When other people come to my house, they do it as well. And it's because she has formed this habit, she doesn't have it in her hand at all times, which means that she's not constantly refreshing, 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 right? She's got the balance and it's working for us for right now. I may come back next year when she's 13 and say, no, this isn't working anymore. But for right now, it is. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, they also need to be accountable. If they're going to get a device, they need to be accountable for that device. I think that's really important. And the third thing to decide whether or not they need it or whether or not you're going to give it to them is, do you understand how it works and do they? And do they also understand your role in all of this? You may say to that child, listen, we're going to get you this device, but remember, I can see absolutely everything you do. That's a good thing to tell your children. Even if you have no idea how to do that, still tell them that, right? Do you remember when your parents said things like, oh, I have eyes in the back of my head, I can see everything you do? And we know that they did it, but for some reason we still believed it. Yeah, tell them you can see absolutely everything. Um, I do not, parental control software, which is usually the next question with this, it doesn't work very well. I'm just very honest about this. Parental control control software is great for setting expectations. It will absolutely not keep your children safe, not at all. And a lot of times it causes more problems than it does good. So I think I was talking to a parent, oh, yes, we were just talking about this, that kids, if they bring the device to school for whatever reason, they can't then download things that their teachers want them to download or they can't upload something. Or it, it, When it starts to cause problems and they're constantly coming to you saying, hey, can you override this? Can you override this? Just take it off. It's done. It's over. You cannot use these filters anymore. And the truth is the filters don't even work very well anyway because we've got things like YouTube and Musical.ly and Instagram and all these places where the information isn't curated. And so it's not tabbed saying that there's adult content involved in this. I did an experiment about six months ago where I wanted to see how quickly I could get to pornographic material from YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. I know, this is what I do for fun. <laughs> If anyone ever looked at my browsing history, it would not look good. Um, so I wanted to see just how, how quickly I could get to it. In every instance, I got to it in one click. In every single instance. So then I decided to turn on a uh, kid-friendly browser and search engine, and one click. One click away at all times. So if our kids, think about the, so if the internet is a vortex that sucks information. The World Wide Web, which is part of this vortex, it's a community with a trillion places to go and three billion people there. That's the biggest community we will ever be a part of. Yes? So if we don't let our kids walk out the front door and not ask them where they're going, why do we let them wander a community all alone in private, in secret, and not know where they're going? When we can get the devices in a public space, that's actually the best parental control you could possibly ask for. Is it going to stop them from seeing stuff? Not necessarily. But are they going to are they going to come to you and ask the questions they need to ask before they start Googling it? Yeah. If you're nearby, they absolutely will. Thomas, who's now 20 years old, my nephew, when he was about 11, um, he was he was at the house and um, he opened up an email link. And I heard the music. It was the that music, right? And so I leaped over the table and I closed the laptop. And then I sat back and I said, do you have any questions? And he said, oh yeah. Somebody had sent him a link to two women having uh, engaging in a sex act. And he, had, he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. He didn't even understand how that was possible. And he had some questions. <laughs> and so we proceeded to have a very interesting conversation, a very honest and open conversation. But what I found most interesting about my conversation is it ended up in a place where it was, why would somebody put that online? That was where he got to. He got to the place of why would somebody give up control of their body in that way and put this online for other people to see? And I felt good in that moment to be able to have a conversation with him about what real relationships look like and how what he was seeing online is not a real relationship. These are paid actors who have signed contracts, who have agreed to do these things, who have given up this control of their body. It is not something I would ever do, but that was their choice. My choice is to keep relationships where they belong, which is intimate, right? Private, between two people, that is full of love and mutual respect and kindness and caring and empathy. 
not exposing myself in a way for everybody else to see. And in having that conversation with him, the next thing I asked is, so what would have happened if you were upstairs doing your work when this link came through? And he said, yeah, I would have kept watching it and then I would have Googled it. But because he was downstairs with me in that moment, we were able to have that conversation instead. Yes? So that addresses a familial setting at home. Mm -hmm. But what it doesn't address is children who now all have devices who are in public places. Yeah. They're still sharing, and no doubt adult supervision or yep. close contact with parents. parent. Absolutely. So some kids are not ready to have the whole internet in their pocket. There are definitely a lot of kids that are not ready to have the internet in their pocket. You can absolutely, if you want to, use the restrictions that are native to the devices, if you want, to try and limit the adult content that they can be exposed to. But again, it's not going to stop the child from a friend exposing them to something. So remember I said that you may not necessarily be able to stop them from seeing things you don't want them to see, but we want to be the go-to for the questions afterwards. So even if you didn't have an opportunity to have the conversation because something actually happened, we should still have the conversation that I'm here for you. I'm your parent in every realm. Um, one of the things that kids often find is that they don't want to tell their parents about things that have happened because they think their parents trust them 100%. And if the parents find out that they messed up, they're going to be so disappointed that they'll never get over it. And so that's why kids usually hide the things that they have seen or that they have done. So I tell my children, my children I trust them 92.6%. <laughs> the other 7.4% is their room to be exposed to something or to royally screw up and know I still love them. And I want them to be able to come to me with these things. I want them to come to me with these questions. I check in with my kids on a regular basis on a few topics. Um, and some of them have to do with have you seen anything lately that made you uncomfortable? Has anything happened? Whether it was online or in real life where you just have some questions, you didn't understand why one person did something to another person, and I just asked the question, and all sorts of stuff comes up. I found out through one of these conversations that my daughter Charlie, who's now 12, was exposed to pornographic material at the age of nine. And so I found out about it soon after it happened because one of her friends had brought um, a cell phone to school and showed her the Kim Kardashian sex tape in the bathroom at nine. So I think that friend who has an older sibling had showed it to her and said this is how it trickled down. So Charlie didn't know at nine years old what the word pornography meant, but she had already seen it. And so she had questions about why somebody would do this and what did that mean for them. And her biggest concern was, I feel so badly for them because that's never going to leave the vortex. <laughs> that's where she went at nine years old. But it opens up, when I ask these questions on a regular basis, it opens up those conversations for them to be able to tell me those things. Do I think my kids tell me everything? No, I don't. I'm not delusional thinking that they tell me absolutely everything. I know that they don't. The same way I didn't tell my parents absolutely everything. But it's the big stuff I want them to know that they can come to me about. Yes? You just said um, what happens online and what happens in real life. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you talk to your kids in terms of you give them a device which is a tool for communication and using it as a tool rather than what I think is becoming, which is a way of living. Like, everybody talks about this is how people communicate now, this is how kids, you know, interact. All of their life is online. So but even you just said this is real life and this is online. How do you give a kid who doesn't understand the difference and help them know the difference? So the question is, how do you give a child a device and help them understand the difference between the real world and the digital world and how everything is the same? No, how it's different. Or is it the same? It is the same. To me, it's the same. And so that's usually what I do. So remember, it's got to be, if you're going to hand a child a device or let them have an account, it comes with three things. It's got to require a life event that's kind of pushing this to happen. So again, that life event can be lots of things. They need to have it for different reasons. A life event, by the way, can also be social, too that the child needs it to be able to communicate with friends in whatever way that is. Um, but I want that it also comes with accountability and them understanding their role in all of this and your role too. And that conversation is, listen, the rules are the same in the real world and in the digital world. I don't let you walk out the front door and not ask you where you're going. Please don't think you get to wander a community with a trillion places and three billion people and not ask you where you're going. I like to know who your friends are. So guess what? I want to know who your friends are online too. 
This is a really big one. If I could take the word stranger and the word danger and separate them and never say them together again, I would. Because not all strangers are dangerous and not all people who are dangerous to our children are strangers. 96% of children who are sexually abused are abused by someone they know, not someone they don't know. Not only that, when they start playing games online like Fortnite and somebody helps them level up, this person who they've never met before, I don't care if this person is 8, 12, 24, 102, it does not matter to me. They take that person immediately and that person becomes a friend because they were nice to them. Somebody gave them gold, somebody helped them level up, somebody posted something nice on their Instagram or on their, you know, a comment on YouTube, and now this person is their friend in our children's minds. No, that person's still a stranger. But this whole idea that we teach kids about stranger danger is what we want to move away from. So the next part of the conversation, after we talk about control and privacy, is personal safety. Okay. Do any of you have a personal safety plan? Do you have a personal safety plan? Does anybody in here have a plan of with your family what to do in case of an earthquake? Or what to do in case of a fire? Yes? Okay, we, we talk about these things. I mean, we just, did you guys do the great shakeout here? Okay, so we just did a personal safety plan with the great shakeout. Um, have any of you, do any of your kids have code words with you? Right? My kids are not allowed to get in anybody's car. It's, when Missing and Exploited Children put out that pamphlet a couple of years ago that said, if your child walks home from school and a stranger pulls up in a van next to them, tell your kids don't get in the van. And I ripped it up, and Lainey, my little one, she's like, why does that make you so mad? I said, because if Mr. Jones, who lives down the street, pulled up and said, hey, Lainey, I'll drive you home, you don't get in his car either. You don't get in anyone's car unless I told you it was okay. Period. And so those code words have come in really handy because there are some times, yesterday, or, uh, yesterday wait, Tuesday, was a perfect example when the plane um, came down on the 101 freeway. Um, so I ended up having to take home eight children from my daughter's elementary school because parents, they knew I was in the area, and parents, actually, we used SnapMap, which I thought was kind of funny. Do you know what SnapMap is? So SnapMap is an app that you can use to see where your friends are. And it's like a little avatar, and it shows you where everybody is. Sometimes the kids use it to exclude one another and be really mean, like, hey, we're all here and you're not. Other times, it comes in really handy, like yesterday. So on Tuesday, so a couple of my friends were all on SnapMap together because I've been testing it out, and so I got a group of my friends to do it with me. Are you on SnapMap? No, not yet. Okay, we'll get there. So, um, so uh, they saw that I was actually in Oak Park, that I was near the school, and so they all texted me saying, "Hey, can you pick up my child?" And so here I go into this, I go into the classroom, and I'm collecting all these kids, and I had two kids that said to me, "Do you know my password?" Right? Because they aren't allowed to go with me until I knew it. So I texted the parents, and I'm like, you got to tell me the passcode so I can pick up your child. And they did. And I was really impressed, one, that the, that the parents had, had done this, but even more so that those two children would not go with me until I knew that password. we got to practice those things with them. As the kids get older, those passwords become really important for other reasons because your kids are going to end up sometimes in situations where they're not comfortable and they may want you to come and get them, and so you want them to have a way to be able to tell you that with maybe not having to tell all their friends that they're not comfortable in that situation. So those personal safety plans are really, really important. You should have everybody in your house, their usernames, their accounts, their passwords, their passcodes, everything. This should not be like hidden information within the family. And the reason for that is because we need quick information. And so my husband, he has all of my information, right? If I don't make it home today for whatever reason, he's going to go into my calendar to see if I decided to, to see where I was. Then he's going to go into my email to see if I agreed to go meet a friend for, you know, for dinner and I forgot to tell him. These all require passwords. Our children are considered runaways before they're considered missing people, sometimes at the age of eight, depending on the county and the particular law enforcement agency. We need quick access to information. So if you've got an older child who's like, absolutely, you're not getting my passwords, I don't trust you for whatever reason, have them put it in a piggy bank that has no plug. So that way they know that if they come home one day and it's shattered into bits, that you looked. But it's a personal safety plan to have all that information accessible. So we want to do that. And then we want to trust but verify. Again, 
92.6%. We want to make sure they understand that we are there for them in every situation. Personal safety is two things. It requires that we teach kids, one, don't give people information they don't need to have, and two, don't develop friendships or cultivate relationships with people and hide them from me, your parent. That is what's dangerous. In all the years that I've been doing this, I work with both local and federal law enforcement, I've never, ever, ever had a case or seen a situation where a child like posted a picture and then some predator went to a website, found their home address, went to the house and took them. That never happens. Never. Predators, that's way too dangerous for them. Instead, they just develop friendships with these kids to, to the point where these kids trust them and then the kids go to the predator. That's what happens. So if our children understand that they shouldn't give people information they don't need to have, and they shouldn't be developing these friendships and hiding it from us, that's what's going to keep them safe. So here's how you have that conversation with a younger child. Do any of you ever take your kids into Starbucks? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay, so we're in LA, a lot of us go to Starbucks. Um, so, or coffee bean, or peace coffee, whatever you choose. So do you encourage your children to order their own food and their own drinks in these situations? We usually do, starting around six, seven years old. We want them to do this because we want them to develop these communication skills that are really important. We're forcing our children to talk to strangers. We are, which we should do, because we are standing right there with them in the beginning, helping them to determine what they can and cannot say to this person. So what if the person behind the counter says, okay, what do you want to drink? And your child says, okay, I want a vanilla bean frappuccino. Great, the next question is, what's your name? Can your child tell this stranger their name? Yes, because it's the right time, the right place, the right environment, you're standing right there. Can they use a fake name? Sure, real name? Sure, does not matter. But then what if the next question is, so what's your favorite color? Do you play any sports? What's your favorite sports team? Do you follow anybody? Do you have any pets? What are your pets' names? How many of your kids would know that's weird? Because if they don't know that that is weird, they should not have access to any social media, to any gaming environments, to any online activity without immediate supervision. Because they are going to start to give people information that is detrimental to your financial health. Those questions are usually the answers to your security questions and sometimes they're even your passwords because we as parents tend to use things like our children's names or pets or you know, favorite colors or a combination of these things in our passwords and we answer our security questions with these things. So identity thieves love kids in gaming and social media environments for this exact reason, because they're playing Fortnite. And now they're in a multiplayer environment and that person at the other end isn't asking their, what we call ASL, age, sex, location, right? Or their, the school that they go to or anything that they consider to be personal information. So if somebody says, so what's your favorite color? They think, oh, there's nothing wrong with telling them that. Why is that person asking their favorite color? It's one of two reasons. They are either trying to fish for information for, to steal identities or they're trying to develop a friendship with your child in that place and in that moment, and that's the night, not right place or moment to do it. Because there is no place in your children's lives right now where they develop friendships without some sort of adult interaction, supervision, or intention. If you bring your children to school each day, you drop them off in a location, you say, you can talk to all these people, right? You take them to sleepaway camp, you say, you can talk to all these people. You take them to a sporting, to their sports, or to drama, or to their art class. You can talk to all these people. But when they're online, are we saying to them, all right, I'm sitting here watching you play this game. You can talk to all these people, but you can only say X, Y, and Z. That's where we start to make the rules the same as the real world and the, and the digital world. That was a really long answer for that question, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> Is there another question? Did you have a question? Oh, please. So the, I'm, I'm just anticipating when my kid gets to 13, oh, I'm, I'm 13 now, and all these other people have had social media mm -hmm. accounts already, and, you know, I don't agree with that, but, and I don't know when she'll be able to get one, but I'm just curious what you're... Sure. So the question is, what do I think about parents creating social media accounts for their children? Um, I actually kind of think it depends on why they've done it in the first place. 
Um, it does uh, bother me a little bit, and I, I don't love when I see parents who have younger children that um, are just creating the account so that they can kind of put up all these pictures of their child. What the parents are doing is they're actually creating a digital tattoo for their child without realizing it. And they're taking away a child's control of their own image. And so what we don't want to do is we don't actually even want to take pictures or post pictures of our children without their permission. So that's the first piece of it. So if that's why it's happening, that's how I feel about it. There's another reason why I see it happen though, and it's because you have a 12 year old and everybody else is 13, and you don't want your child to break the law and have a social media account before they're allowed to, so you create the account for them so that they can kind of participate with their friends without having it on their own device and without having the responsibility of the account itself. So I think it kind of depends on the intent. Um, if you're doing it for that reason, because your child feels completely ostracized, because they're not getting access to information, because they can't communicate with their friends, that I get. But if you're the parent who has this on your device, be really, really careful. One, don't make it your account with them. So do not respond to anything that you see on that account. Don't parent other people's children on these accounts. Don't chastise other children on these accounts. Um, if you feel that something is unsafe or a parent needs to know, contact the parent directly and don't do it through the social media account because that's not fair. That's kind of like they're all in the bedroom having a sleepover and now you're in the bedroom with them watching everything they do and telling them what they can and cannot do. Um, so you want to be careful. The other thing is, is if you're going to do that, you're going to end up with information that you're not going to know what to do with. And that part's really tough because you may not have a relationship with this other parent or feel like you can contact them and say, hey, your kid is doing things that you may not approve of. So you're gonna have to have a conversation with your child about what you're going to do in those situations. Um, I, I always say, hold off as long as you can hold off because the truth is with social media, if they have not gained their um, emotional intelligence yet, social media is going to be a disaster. It, it just is. Emotional intelligence is the number one indicator of whether or not somebody is ready for social media. High emotional intelligence means that you're able to see things that are coming in online and it does not affect you emotionally or mentally because maybe you weren't included or maybe that person's life looks better than yours or whatever it is. But most 12 and 13 year olds don't have that emotional intelligence yet. So what I usually ask a child before they get any social media is I'll say, all right, Here's how you know. What are you going to do when you see that all of your friends are someplace and you were not included? What are you going to do then? What are you going to do when somebody is encouraging you to post something that you know is not right, but you feel like you really need to please them? Because what you want to do is gauge the emotional intelligence. I actually just had this happen. Um, so my two best friends from high school, one lives in Austin and one lives in Sherman Oaks. And I never go on Facebook. And the only reason I opened it up is because I had 83 notifications and I don't like it when I have that little red bubble. It kind of it stresses me out that there's 83 things that I've missed. So I'll open up the app just so that they clear off and go away. So when I opened up, the, when I opened up Facebook, the first picture that showed up were my two best friends, the one from Austin and the one from Sherman Oaks at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I'm like, wait. That means she flew in from Austin and the two of them were at an event together and I didn't know anything about it. I had no idea that she had come in from Austin. So I actually commented on the picture saying, what the heck, you two are so busted, right? And so I immediately get a phone call from my best friend in Austin and she's like, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I am so sorry. And I said, no, you didn't hurt my feelings. I get it. The three of us have been close for 25 years. And there are times when it's just me and my best friend from Austin. There are other times where it's just me and my best friend from Sherman Oaks. And there's nothing wrong with the two of them being together and going to an event either. I just found the whole thing funny because I never go on Facebook. And she actually said to me, she said, the reason I post the picture is because you never go on Facebook. And so I didn't think you would see this. <laughs> She wasn't intentionally trying to hurt my feelings. But the truth was, is my feelings weren't hurt. They really, truly were not hurt. Why? Because I feel like I have such a solid relationship with these two women that I didn't feel left out. I actually felt happy for the two of them that they got to spend some time together. How many 12 and 13 year olds can say that? That's something that comes with years and years and years and years and years of developing emotional intelligence. But it also had more to do with my relationship with each of them more than anything else. And when you are 13 years old, you don't always feel really bonded to a specific group. If you do, social media actually can work to your benefit because you can share things in a way where you feel like you're part of a group and there's an extension from school to home and you sharing. 
But when you don't know who your people are, and when you kind of feel like, do people like me? Do they not like me? What's going on? That's when things go awry. So you're going to have to kind of look at all of it to determine whether or not they're even ready for it. Okay? Those are excellent questions. Um, is technology affecting relationships? Do you feel that technology is affecting our relationships? Does anyone feel this way? Does anyone feel that technology is actually making our relationships better? I'm the only one. You, yes, I do. I actually think technology makes my relationships better. Um, I think that we have found a way in our house to use it where it actually does make relationships better. But we started with developing habits, shaping habits that make sense for us, and those habits are based on what we started with. What did we start with? Charging station. Oh, the charging station, yes. <laughs> Sorry, even before the charging station, with our values. That's where this all starts. That if we develop habits around our values, then these things, these technology things, can enhance the relationship rather than tear it down. So does anyone in here have some technology-free spaces? Is there any space in your house where it's just like, or any time in your house where there's just no technology? What are some of these technology-free zones or spaces? At the, dinner at the dinner table. That's usually the biggest one. So our technology-free zones are at the dinner table, on short car trips, and in the bedrooms. We actually do not use, uh, for the most part, we don't use technology on short car trips just because it's like the only 10 minutes sometimes I get with my kids, and so I like to have those 10 minutes. Um, but sometimes they'll get in the car, and Charlie might say to me, I can't talk to you right now. I just, I need to decompress, or I need to send a text to this person, or I need to take care of something. And there are certain times, because she has said to me, I need to do this, do you mind? Can you give me a minute? Now I don't feel ignored. Now I don't feel upset. It doesn't happen very often. But the dinner table is another one of these places where we do not bring technology, unless we have to. So my husband may say to the family, he may say, it'll be on the charging station, um, you know what, I've got stuff going on with work and I've got some time sensitive things going on. I'm really sorry, but if my phone rings, I'm going to have to get up and take it. Okay, and so the phone might ring and he says two words that fixes everything in our relationship. Excuse me. Excuse me. He says these two little words and all of a sudden nobody feels ignored. It's not impacting our relationships in a negative way. He needed to take care of something. We can understand that. He takes care of it. He comes back two minutes later and all is well. So last year, my Charlie said, Charlie said to me, my best friend Elle is having a crisis. If my phone rings, can I take the call during dinner? <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, in this situation, sure. If she did this every single night, no. <laughs> but because I was able to say to her, yeah, you know what, this one time when, she, when the phone rang, and it did, she did the same thing. Can you excuse me for a minute? And then that was that. Several years ago, we used to have the devices in the bedroom. And my husband and I would sit side by side, and we would both be doing this, right? We'd be sitting in bed side by side and doing this. And we were fighting all the time, all the time. And I've been with my husband since like, middle school. And so it was really kind of strange for us to be arguing the way that we were. And we realized what it was. I was telling him things, and he didn't hear me. And so then he would say, no, I didn't know that I was supposed to do this, and I would get mad. And the same thing. He would be telling me something, and then I wouldn't do it, and he would get mad. And it was because we were sitting side by side having two totally different conversations. I'm telling him all the things I needed him to know that were coming from that device. He was telling me all the things that I needed to know that were coming from the device, and we weren't even having the same conversation. But we were both going, uh-huh, yeah, OK, got it. When we got those devices out of our bedroom, that all stopped. We did not realize the impact it was having on our relationship. And when we took them out of the equation, it made a really big difference. The other thing it did is it helped us all sleep better too. If I could get you guys to do one thing after today, it would be to really try and get the cell phones out of the bedrooms at night when you go to bed. Many, many things happen. First of all, when you take the device to bed with you, the blue light that comes from the device, it causes your circadian rhythm to think it's daytime instead of nighttime. Okay. So a lot of people will just dim the light, and then they think, okay, well, now this is all right. But then the second problem is, is you don't get off the device, and neither do the kids. It's always one more comment, one more text, one more episode, one more, one more, and now all of a sudden it's much later than you meant for it to be. 
For the kids, you often sometimes see a light on in their room, so you go in there and they shove the phone underneath their pillows so you don't see that they have it, which then brings me to problem number three, which is a science problem. Um, and if anybody has a phone that's turned off, does anyone have a phone that's turned off, or does anyone want to turn, will they turn off their phone for me real fast so I can show you what this looks like? But um, we've got some issues with something called electromagnetic frequency, electro, and also electromagnetic force, I mean EMFs, depends on what we're talking about. And these are uh, low frequency, non-ionized, thank you, radiation waves. This is not, and sorry, I'm gonna have to, to put down the mic for a minute, this is not the same kind of radiation that comes from x-ray machines. It does not penetrate or hurt our organs. However, we now know for a fact that in high concentrated doses, anything more than 35 units within 10 feet of your head suppresses melatonin, which is the hormone that helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. So, you can find me. Let me show you what's coming out of your phones. How many units did I say you could use within 10 feet of your head? 35. Okay, and this phone is off. This phone is off. And the reason, thank you so much, the reason I asked for the phone to be off is because one of the biggest, one of the biggest misnomers is that as long as it's off, then you can sleep with it. Or if it's in airplane mode, then you can use it as your alarm clock. It does not work that way. Energy is never gained nor destroyed, which means it's present all the time. So even if the phone is off, those EMFs are still there. And so it still affects the production and distribution of melatonin. So we want to make sure that we get them out of the bedroom so it does not happen, especially for our children. With their smaller brains that are still developing, it really has a serious impact. And when kids don't get a good night's sleep, they need, in middle school, they need nine and a quarter hours. In elementary school, they need 10 to 12 hours of sleep. If they're not getting that, it affects their mood, their memory, and their metabolisms. At least 10 feet. So remember I said I put those echo dots in my house? The reason I did that was for this exact reason, because my kids kept saying, but I need an alarm clock. So what I did, I'll come to you in just a second, I put the echo dots across the room, and that way the waves, they dissipate in the air. And so by the time they get to the children and where they're sleeping, there's no effect. They now have music, they have audiobooks, they have meditation, they have um, their alarm clocks, but they have no screen to distract them from going to sleep. And I have disabled the ability to text through this thing as well. Okay, because one of the other problems, there and then there, one of the other problems we were having, especially for Charlie, is that um, her friends were texting her all night long. And so when she would wake up in the morning, she would get 250 uh, texts that she had not yet answered, and it started her day off in this incredibly stressful way that she was so upset because she already felt 250 messages behind. And so she finally said to her friends, can we just agree not to text after 9 p.m.? And they actually I all said yes. One of the things I find so fascinating about middle schoolers is, believe it or not, they do not want to be tethered to the technology the way they are. They really don't. They feel anxious and stressed, but why do they do it? Because they want to please their peers. But if they're all feeling the same way and don't realize it, that's when these kinds of issues take place. Okay? Yes? So can you comment a little bit about, so that's EMF radiation phone, there's also radiation issues from Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi and RF, yes. And so Wi-Fi um, traditionally, or, or more recently, was more present in homes, mm -hmm. and now it's been introduced in schools. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of research on all the health issues now, most recently, which is infertility. Mm -hmm. um, so can you sure. comment yes. that and also you provide some resources so that our community can stay ahead Absolutely. of the school? Yes, okay, so a few things, and so that was actually where I was going to next, so perfect. Okay, so I'm, you know what, let me just pull up the slide, and then that way I'll remember to talk about all of it, so thank you. Okay, so is it affecting our physical health? And so a couple of things, just check the time here real quick, okay. Um, so about 15 more minutes, are you guys okay? Okay, I'm almost done. So, um, all right, so is it affecting our physical health? So a couple of things are going on right now. So there are recommendations that are coming from the National Institute of Health, from NIH, and also from the FCC. And every school has to follow these regulations, and they do. And so right now, this is kind of where we're at. Um, there is a movie that is out right now uh, that you can download. It's called Generation Zapped. That's really interesting. That is actually looking at where we started, where we are right now, how Wi-Fi and RF could possibly be affecting us. 
There are a handful of, um, of areas in France that have actually, they have gotten rid of all their Wi-Fi and have hardwired their schools. Um, however, the truth is, is that we don't have any conclusive evidence that there is true harm as far as the Wi-Fi and the RF. There's no significant, re I know, I know, I know. There's a lot of research that is coming, but nothing that says this exact level is safe and this exact level is not safe. And the reason is because we don't have long-term exposure yet. So I tend to mitigate my risks based on this unknown. I am not an alarmist. I am not the type of person who's going to say, I'm just not using my technology anymore because I'm scared that it's going to do something terrible to me. But at the same time, I'll do lots of things to mitigate my risks. The first thing I do is I do not keep my phone on me if I'm not using it. I don't keep it anywhere on my body and I do not have it in my hand unless I need to. That's the first thing I do. And it is, that makes me feel better, right? Because we do know for a fact that the heat from these batteries, boys should not have cell phones in their front pockets, ever, ever. We know for a fact now that it reduces sperm count um, and it's causing infertility in some men. What I find interesting, not surprising, but interesting is we haven't really studied women yet in their reproductive systems and so we don't exactly know what's going to happen. But the, but the community, the medical community has kind of said, well, all of your eggs are housed with inside your ovaries and so we think you're okay. Well, the sperm was housed inside something else too, but whatever. So eventually they'll get to us, the women. Um, so I, I don't keep my phone in my pocket or tucked into my shirt or in my hand unless I have to. I tend to keep it in my purse, but whenever I can, I put it down someplace else, away from me as much as possible. So that's the first thing. I do not sleep with it. I turn my Wi-Fi off whenever I can. I'll actually just, you know, I'll disconnect the Wi-Fi whenever I can. I actually turn off a lot of our devices. I turn them off at night because they don't need to be on. If we can just start by mitigating our risks, we'll be in a really good place. I have a feeling that cell phones are gonna be like microwaves. And one day, all of a sudden, they're gonna be like, oops, sorry, this technology is causing some health issues. We'll fix the technology to solve that problem. But I just don't wanna be a guinea pig in all of this. I don't use Bluetooth. I don't put Bluetooth directly in my ear, ever. And if any of you read the Apple manual, have any of you ever read your iPhone manual? It actually tells you to keep your phone six inches from your head. That's how it tells you to use your iPhone. Because they know that even the low frequency non-ionized radiation should not be pressed against our bodies. And so if we can do things like that, use a wired earpiece, we would be better off. Um, I teach my kids to use the speakerphone if they need to, rather than putting it directly to their head, or use the wired earpiece. Um, I actually tried to have the Bluetooth in my car disabled, and they won't do it, because they say it's a, it's a risk factor. So I just don't use my Bluetooth in my car. I'll just put it on this regular speakerphone on my phone, and that's what I'll do. Sometimes my Bluetooth will automatically enable itself, I don't go crazy when this happens, I let it happen, but as much as I can, I turn off the Bluetooth and I just use my speaker. Because I don't wanna sit in a bubble of it not knowing what it's going to do long term. Um, there have been, there's been a lot of conversations in schools though about whether or not you should be using Wi-Fi. Um, and the truth of it is, is that the, where the access points are housed, and I've done, I've done my own research on this. My undergraduate work was in neuroscience and my graduate work was in technology. So I'm very interested in how the brain is affected by all of this. And so what we have found though is where the access points are, what's happening is the waves are dissipating into the air to the place where even if the kids have the laptops right in front of them, I know it seems like there's a lot, but it's not condensed in a way where it's not, the waves aren't filtering out into the air. Does that make sense? So unless it's directly on top of them. So do not have their laptops on top of them. They should, our laptops should never be directly on our laps. They should actually always be on a desk where you are sitting ergonomically correct with your feet flat on the floor and your hands at your waist. You know, that means not on top of the desk. It actually means under the desk. And we shouldn't be on these devices for more than like 30 minutes at a time without getting up and physically, excuse me, moving around so that we don't hurt our bodies. What about the networking centers? Do those also have yes. the same amount of... Right, but again, if you're not, if it's not here, these waves can't get to you. But if they're in a part of the house, let's say near the kids' rooms, should they? At like 10 feet. 10, 10 feet, feet from away. where they sleep. From where they sleep. Okay, yes. So 10 feet is the 
Minimum. Minimum. What, what do you suggest? Do you suggest more? I suggest not having them in the bedrooms, period. Okay. For all of these reasons. Not just the EMS, but because of the not getting off of them and the blue, and the blue light and all the bad habits that are being created. Yes? Can, do Kindles have the same problem? Because sometimes when I was sitting, and, I, and I'll say, you go out pretty much you know, the light, you fall, and you can't sleep. Yeah. Yes. The Kindles are the exact same. Right? Because we're talking about a field of energy. We're not talking about even the Wi-Fi. So even if it's a paper white, you're going to have some of these issues. So we no longer use the Kindle for nighttime reading. We have moved away from it. I've gone back to my old paperback books. Um, but I will take a Kindle if I go on vacation. Because again, I'm always kind of weighing the cost-benefit analysis. I'm going to mitigate my risks as much as possible, but I can't take six books with me. They're way too heavy. But I can take a Kindle and I can use it for that period of time and then I go back to my paperbacks. Okay, so the anti-radiation phone covers do anything? They push the EMS to the back of the phone instead of the front. So if you have it next to your head, then it's going to push it to the back. It does not stop the melatonin issues because it's just emanating out the back versus the front. I don't because I tend not to put my phone to my head. I mean, I also don't use like third-party parental controls either because my kids are usually only using devices when they're sitting like this far away from me, right? And so it's got, you gotta kind of look at the whole picture here. When we talk about screen time though, one of the things that I find that's helpful is instead of looking, and I'm going back to the beginning now, remember we talked about those arbitrary rules, that two hours a day or that 30 minutes? One of the things that I've also found is in creating healthy habits, it's understanding what to do about screen time. And screen time, we should not put these arbitrary rules on it. And I don't believe that it should be a carrot stick kind of thing, where if you do X, Y, Z, then you get another 15 minutes of screen time. The reason that does not work in my house is because let's say that my children go ahead and they do those three things that I ask them to earn more screen time, but now they also have soccer practice or gymnastics or we have to eat dinner or they gotta take a shower and they need to get to bed. They may not have the 15 minutes. So now what's gonna happen? Negotiation and then conflict. That does not work for me. It doesn't work. And so we change the way we do it. And instead, we ask ourselves three questions. One is, do I have time to be doing this right now or should I be doing something else? Because if I should be doing something else, like homework or sleeping or sitting at the dinner table, it's not the right time and place to be binge watching How I Met Your Mother on Netflix, right? The second question is, how's my physical and ergonomic health? Did I move enough today? Because if we sit more than we move, our bodies are not healthy. Remember I said in the beginning, I have readers in my house. For some reason, Charlie and Lainey love to sit in their closets and read books. They have like strong lights over the top. I don't know why in their closet, but this is like their cozy place that they do this. I don't know, I think it has something to do with wanting to be back in the womb, I don't know. But <laughs> they'll sit in their closet. But after about an hour, I will go in there and I will say, get up, go move. You need to do something else because it's not healthy for your body, especially if you're sitting that's not ergonomically correct. You're all scrunched up like this. You're not, your posture, it's not healthy for you. And then the third thing is, does my behavior work? So you have a child who's really into Fortnite, okay? And this child loves Fortnite more than anything. And now this child says, okay, I promise I can stop playing after 30 minutes. And then 30 minutes is up, and now you have, no, wait, I need five more minutes to start the game, I'll get kicked out the zero, yeah! And then they finally do get off, and they're angry and aggressive, and their behavior is just not your child. Their behavior is not working, and so therefore, they are not ready to be doing that. If you've got a child that is stuck in this pattern of deriving their self-worth from the number of likes they get on an Instagram pic, they are not ready to be using Instagram. If you've got a child that is texting in the middle of the night because they're so afraid of what their peers are going to be saying and doing and they're going to be missing out, then they should not even have a phone available to them at that point in time. We've got to look at the bigger picture here. We've got to look at understanding that privacy means control, that personal safety is about not giving people information they don't need to have and understanding that you're on their side, not on the side of trouble. That their health and wellness is more important than anything else and that it's about your family values and the behavior that's going to drive your decision making in this space. Does that make sense? Do you have any other questions for me?
If we can find balance, that's really where we want to get to. It's about, you know, if you focus on how they sleep, how they eat, how they exercise, we want to think about how are we all using these devices and is it making our life better or worse. Um, I put up there the self-control app. This is an app that allows kids, and this is for my middle school parents, elementary school, they're too young, but if you have a middle schooler and they have a MacBook, right, don't all, do all the middle schoolers have MacBooks, right, um, there is an app called Self-Control that you can, it's free, that you can put on the MacBook, and what it does is the child can then say, for the next 30 minutes, don't let me access Hulu, YouTube, Instagram, whatever it is that distracts them, and it will turn it off just for that period of time. This is a form of neurofeedback. It's teaching their brains how to turn off the stuff that is distracting them. And it's going to help them shape some better habits. I use it myself. Okay? Yes? I have a technical question. Sure. Um, we didn't have Wi-Fi upstairs, so our, our technology guy put something up right next to our bed, like a little disc thing. It's on the floor. Yes. So that's not good to sleep. Around, no. Right? You have like a hot spot on your floor. Should I just disconnect it? Yeah. Is, is there something? If you can just put it like outside the bedroom in the hallway, it'll probably still allow you to have uh, access. And then my daughter's room, um, I mean, there's a, there's another hot spot. Mm -hmm. um, in the cabinet, but on the other side is, is her room. Yeah. So I should disconnect that too. If you can, because the EMS, they go through the walls, and so what you want to really just think about is the distance that you want to get it as far away from where their heads are on the pillow. That's your goal. Okay? Thank you so much for being here, you guys. I will stay and answer as many questions as you have, but for the sake of time, and thank you for being here, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.